All right, folks, for, for those of us in the room and those of you online, we'll go, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Uh, first, a few announcements. Um, we have initiated our new class for 2022, and the class begins in January, January 19th. And what we did is we sent the invitation out to uh, folks that said that they were interested. And we had about 20 to 24 or so folks on the list. And so we decided to give them a few days to take a look at that. But we'll shortly publish that on our Facebook page, send it out to the listserv. If you know of anyone that's interested, please pass that along. So that will begin January 19th. Uh, and in fact, you can point them to our homepage. There's already uh, our new class registration page is already there. Um, I am working on a new list of officers for 2022. Uh, I look out for the email with those list of officers. Uh, we will need to vote for them in January. Well, I'm sorry, for December. Uh, and then they take their, their role uh, beginning in January. And if once I send out the list, if you know of anybody that's interested for a position, regardless of whether there's somebody there that is already willing to take it, uh, let me know. So you're certainly free to nominate anybody that you wish for that position. Uh, you will see my name listed for president for 2022. I'm happy to share that or give that to anybody who wishes as well. So just let me know. Uh, but I'm happy to do it for one more year if if I'm still your best uh, choice as you wish. Uh, we are undergoing the, the budget planning for 2022. If there's any initiative any park that you want to support, any project that you want to support, now's the time to let us know so that we can allocate funds for it. Uh, certainly let us know how much money you think you need and what are the initiatives that you want to accomplish. Uh, Ramsey's always one, for example, that's always on the list. Any other project that's out there, uh, we'll get fish trails on the list. And again, any other initiative that we can think of for that. Uh, the, our Pelican Squadron, has created, and I'll try to hold this up for folks online, have created these shirts, which are going to be one of our methods of raising money towards this, uh, the plight of the Pelicans. If you, as many of us know that on Highway 48, Highway 100, during the fall, during these bad cold fronts, uh, unfortunately, they're like sitting ducks out there for the drivers. And so one of the ways that we thought that, well, Yes, we want to sp spread the word. One, we can do it via these shirts, but also this helps us raise money for other things that we can do to bring that about. So they have this one shirt. If you remember, we had a contest where the students from Fort Isabel created the artwork. Uh, they selected which ones. You got Senor Pele here on my left and second place. I don't think he got to get a name on the right. So we came up with this really cool shirt. The ladies did. They came up with a nice design and has a Great logo on the side for our chapter uh, with a little image of the Pelican as well. So that's the city right there. So again, this is one shirt with a two designs on it. Have a second one. You can read it. If I can read it. It says I break for Pelicans on the front. Then we got a third one with Senor Pele. Again, the competition was, if you remember, to name our Pelican mascot for this uh, outreach effort. So this one says, I break for Senor Pelican. So again, these are the shirts that the, the Pelican Spartan designed. Uh, when they're out there at the Burning Festival this weekend, they'll be wearing them as well. And so this is one of our initiatives to say, you know what, there's a lot that we can do as far as outreach goes. So all these great things that we know are out there, whether it's an issue or a problem, we're just simply trying to promote it. If you are part of a group, if you are part of, let's say, Ramsey, think of a shirt that would promote Ramsey, the plants of Ramsey, the birds of Ramsey. Think of a design that we can put on something like a shirt, a cap, or anything, something that can help us generate funds that go back to that project. So any project that you can think of, any initiative, any outreach effort that we can do, this is sort of our first shot effort at what we can do. And again, there's this is just one example of what uh, these folks have done. What other things can we do? And I already have a bunch of them in my mind, but I don't wanna hog all the shirt building and all this kind of stuff. And again, these are relatively inexpensive. Uh, these folks have already done the research. They're not that expensive, but then we can generate a profit and still not sell them for a whole heck of a lot of money. These shirts, for example, we're selling for about $20 and we make about 
for sure. Again, we're not going to break the bank on anybody, hopefully, but still make this reasonable and, and still generate some funds. It'll pay back for itself and we get money to move forward. Okay. So these are the great charts that they can help with. And let me see, I want to go ahead and invite Joni for milestone. Well, we don't have anything in, in our in our website for that. Um, and one of the things that we've discovered, we can always use PayPal to help take the money from you, but PayPal always wants their cut. So what you'll notice, by the way, it is about time to renew your dues for 2022. On our website, you can pay there via PayPal, but we do charge you an extra dollar to offset the cost of giving PayPal some of your money. So instead, if you'd rather mail a check, give it to us during our next chapter meeting, you're more than welcome to do so instead. So these may not be necessarily online to purchase, but we do have the box of shirts right here, by the way. So we'll find other events to do that. Okay. Okay, we have some people who have reached uh, some milestones. Um, Unfortunately, most of them aren't here this evening, but I do want to recognize them and I hope to get their things to them um, probably, hopefully next week after the birding festival. But person who is definitely here tonight, uh, she's earned her 250 hour pin. I'd like to recognize Betsy Hossett. Everybody can see them. <laughs> this is Betsy. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Um, I kind of had hoped that, um, well, we've got two people I know they can't drive at night, but they were in this last class with Betsy in the 2021 class. They, <clears throat> excuse me, they have earned their 100 hour pins and I believe they are online tonight. So I'd like to recognize uh, Diana Lehman and Pat um, Avery. So I will be getting their pins to those ladies. Um, I believe this is from last meeting, but Peggy Walker is another person who can't be here and I will get her 500 hour pin to her. Um, and then I was hoping that Kate De Janeiro would be here tonight. She said she was coming in the email she sent me, but it looks like she didn't, but she has certified. Yay, from the 2021 class. So congratulations, Kate, if you're online, I'll get this to you somehow. <laughs> and that's it for this evening. Thank you, everyone. All right, so we're going to move on to our speaker for tonight, uh, Rami Swanson. Rami, I'm going to give you presenter rights in just a second. Uh, for some of you that may know Rami Swanson, uh, he's we got to meet him when he was out helping Mark Conway when or happened to be out there with Mark Conway when he was doing uh, was looking for seaside sparrows. And so we got to talking to figure out who he was and what he did. And Barbara and I both looked at each other and said, we need to figure out a way to get him for our, our chapter. Really interesting person. If you haven't followed him on Facebook or follow his blog or follow his Instagram, uh, I won't steal some of his thunder, but it's just some amazing stuff, amazing photos. I sent out to the chapter. He's on the cover of Forever, what is it? Forever Texas from the Land Texas Conservancy magazine. Great article about him and his wife. Uh, so take a look at that. And with that, Rami, I'll pass it on to you. Do you have the share capability now? Let me take a look here. To share. Give me a thumbs up if you see a copperhead and a title screen. We see Thank you. Thank you. You see it. Good. 
Hey everyone, uh, thank you, thank you for uh, for having me here uh, for one of your one of your meetings. Um, I, I really always enjoy getting to visit with the master naturalist groups across the state of Texas, and um, and I particularly love speaking to this project that I'm involved with this year um, to explore the biodiversity of the state of Texas and all of the the you know, secret corners of the state that harbor that that diversity. But specifically this year, I'm looking at reptiles and amphibians, which we'll, we'll uh, together uh, refer to as herps or herp tiles. Uh, the title of the talk is uh, an exploration of the wonderful wild of Texas. And then the subtitle is Herping Texas 2021, um, which is um, a nod to my big year effort uh, to um, explore the state and see as many species as possible while documenting them uh, through photography. Through the through today's talk, uh, you'll learn a little bit about why the state of Texas is just this crazy special place. Whenever you're talking about biodiversity, uh, you'll also learn a little about a little bit about me, and you'll kind of see my advancement as a photographer because um, while also doing a big year, I picked up photography as a hobby. Uh, right as COVID started, um, and this hobby has really given me the opportunity to explore some techniques, advance a skill, and um, you know, drive my wife crazy with uh, silly lens purchases here and there. So, without uh, much further ado, I will advance the slides and um, and kick this thing off. So, the first part of the talk will will really just be about Texas. Um, and why it's special and some of the challenges it, it faces while the second half of the talk will, will be a bit more narration, natural history and exploring individual species through uh, uh, photos. Get my controls going here. So why is Texas so special? You can see illustrated here in this map that shows all of these uh, continental scale ecological regions across the United States that Texas sits at the crossroads of several examples of continental, uh, continental scale ecosystems, including the Eastern temperate forests that come in uh, from the, the South e the East and Southeast here and teeter into some of these, uh, Oh, um, excuse me, these uh, Blackland Prairie and, and post Oak Savannah portions of our state. You see uh, certainly the influence of the Great Plains cutting across the central part of this part of the state in this almost virtual uh, vertical like stripe. And then over here in the West, we can see the North American deserts influence in the Trans Pecos ecoregions, the mountains and basins ecoregions of far west Texas. Dialing in a little bit further, we can we can sort of delineate uh, twelve specific ecoregions within the state of Texas, and you know you're you're probably familiar with this map. This is a pretty popular one down there where you're at. You're still considered um, either in the Gulf Coast prairies and marshes ecoregions or the Southern Texas plains, and some mixture of those. And I would uh, I would argue that 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 portion of South Texas. That you're in does not look much like the rest of the Gulf Coast prairies and marshes uh, further north, but um, you you are certainly lumped within those major ecoregions of the state. It, looking at this map, it sort of dials in to some of the um, or or the collection of vegetation cover types across the state of Texas Texas Parks and Wildlife map. It's very noisy. But it does a pretty decent job of delineating those vegetation cover types. To me, it really looks like a, a map um, that uh, a, a grandchild got loose with a pack of crayons and just and just cut loose. There, there's not a whole lot of uh, seeming rhyme or reason to that, but it it really does nod to the underlying ge uh, geological formation, soil types, and hydrology, and other elements. Um, so this is a conglomeration of many different uh, abiotic, um, abiotic influences that that do influence the the bi biotic vegetation. Perhaps most interestingly, though, is this is is the wide spectrum of elevational gradients that you can see within Texas, with over three hundred and fifty 
miles of coastline here uh, at zero feet elevation uh, set apart by elevations over here in far west Texas exceeding 8,750 feet. Um, not many folks know that we have over 10 peaks in the state of Texas that exceed 8,000 feet in elevation, primarily exclusive to the Davis Mountains here and the Guadalupe Mountains there on the North New Mexico, Texas border. Uh, the Davis Mountains uh, who are centered here kind of around Jeff Davis County in far west Texas, they have over 800 square miles of surface area above one mile in elevation. So 800 square miles of surface of surface elevation that exceeds one mile in elevation. That's a staggering number. So Fort Davis and some of the very small communities and some homes in that area are certainly part of the mile high club. Um, if you if you need a better reference, since the Davis Mountains are pri are largely uh, privately owned, but many people are more familiar with the Chisos Mountains in in the Big Bend National Park. The Chisos Mountains have less than ten square miles of elevation exceeding one mile, so it's a much smaller footprint. We also see an exceeding amount of variability across the precipi precipitation gradient from uh, over 64 inches at a, on occasion over here in Southeast Texas uh, near Beaumont to less than 12 here in El Paso. Um, you can see, and I like this map for this reason, you can kind of see some of these rain shadows that exist where the mountains, the Fort Davis, or the Davis Mountains, the Chisos Mountains, the Guadalupe Mountains, sort of influence their own weather and cause for more rainfall because of the movement of, of air uh, hitting uh, rain rich or moisture rich clouds as they move across the landscape. Um, most of the state of Texas experiences a, a sort of bimodal rainfall system, meaning that there's good rainfall pulses in the spring and again in the fall. And so you'll see a lot of species whose natural histories will be associated with those bimodal rainfall events or seasons, whereas the western western part of the state is, is more um, more associated with monsoonal influences. So there's one significant season, typically in the summer, where they receive the bulk of their rainfall. So much variability in the abiotic, those non biological factors, these non living elements that influence all of the biology of the state. But you can experience this variability in other ways. It's not just maps, it's not just a presentation, but it's also living it in real life. And I'll share a couple of stories from my from my personal travels. Now, these maps and pictures aren't great, but they're they're what I had. Uh, you'll notice on this map that there's a star. That star um, is supposed to be associated with where San Antonio is so that you have a reference point as you're looking at it. Uh, so keep those keep those things in mind. Um, we're looking at a barred owl here, and a barred owl is a very eastern distributed species, and it's typically associated with the hardwood bottomland forests and pine oak uh, forests of the east. Uh, so at one, and the reason I'm telling the story is because at one point in one point in one space in time, at the same time, I observed this species, a barred owl, not a big deal, big whoop. Well, I pivoted and here I am again, there's San Antonio and, and we're looking at now a varied bunting photograph. And you can see from this distribution map that varied bunting is a very Western distributed species. So species associated with the western part of the state and the United States and even into Mexico. Uh, so while I was standing at one point in space and observing a barred owl, I pivoted and I saw a varied bunting. Well, that's pretty cool. The convergence of an eastern distributed species and a western distributed species all at one point at one time. Well, I take one more look and I and I look up along in this mesquite and I see a singing Moralette seed eater and you can see the star again there over San Antonio and you can see the range map that I pulled from eBird observations that this is a very southern distributed species. So now at one point in one place in Texas, I'm seeing three different species that are representative of 
completely different uh, portions of the continent. And it all happened in one point in space in Val Verde County, Del Rio, Texas, along San Felipe Creek. San Felipe Creek supports the last little bit of, of habitat for barred owl from the east. And you can certainly see varied buntings and scattered abundance in the western part of the state. And more or less seed eaters whom prefer a habitat uh, uh, associated, at least in Texas, with the reeds that grow along the Rio Grande, the reedy, tall vegetation of the Rio Grande and its tributaries, of which San Felipe Creek and Del Rio is. So it's very interesting. It doesn't, it's not just birds though. Excuse me, I kind of got ahead of myself, but um, here's a map of the bird diversity of Texas, just to clearly illustrate that Texas is a hot spot for bird diversity. Uh, you can see the heat map here along the Texas coast, some of the influences within South Texas where you guys are, and then the influences here into the central portions that if you're looking at uh, of these 591 species uh, considered in this study that um, a, a heavy percentage of those occupy the state of Texas at some point during their natural life cycles, whether that's migratory, whether that's overwintering, resident, um, or a breeding species. <clears throat> now, well, I play this game too with with reptiles and um, in particular snakes. And, it, and you know, birds are very mobile, so it is. It makes a lot of sense that you might see. Um, disparate representations within birds because they can fly, but snakes not so much. And and uh, so I love to, I love to really make the case in point by by illustrating that. Again, here we have a map that illustrates the state is kind of cut in half. The eastern part uh, is showing the range and observations of this of the timber rattlesnake, another species associated with hardwood bottomlands, at least within Texas. It's a very eastern distributed species. The limits of its range cut just uh, short of the Edwards Plateau uplift, um, and it teeters down you know, historically into the Corpus Christi area. Here we have the eastern black-tailed rattlesnake that, despite its name, is a very western distributed species. Now, there is a western black-tailed rattlesnake, and it occurs further west in the New Mexico, Arizona. But in, in Texas, we have the eastern flavor, which is actually a western distributed species, as illustrated by the map. If we cut the state in half, roughly there's the line, San Antonio here. We can see that much of the much of the species range within Texas is, a, is in the western half of the state. And then finally, we're looking at the Texas indigo snake, something that I imagine all of you are familiar with, rancher's best friend. Again, we're cutting the state in half, but this time we're cutting it the other way. Here's San Antonio, and we're going horizontal. So most of the species range within the state of Texas is southern. So we have east meets west, eats south, meets south through the lens of snakes, a non-migratory, non not a highly mobile species. And that can happen in, the, in Bear County where San Antonio occurs. Now, you can still see eastern black-tailed rattlesnakes up and around government uh, Canyon State Natural Area in the Northwest. You can still see indigo snakes in the Southern portions of the county that maybe you go look around Mitchell Lake Audubon Center. And, um, and there are some historic records for the timber rattlesnake in Bear County, although it's assumed that they're extirpated now, timber rattlesnake did occur along the San, San Antonio River bottom before it was developed historically. So very fascinating. Another another case where, you know, one area in in space, you could observe at least historically three different species representative of completely disparate regions of the continent. And there's another. Here's a here's the uh, matching heat map to illustrate reptile diversity, and you can see pretty much that all of Texas is warm uh, compared to the rest of the country. It's an incredible amount of diversity in the state of Texas, and again. It's not just maps, it's lived experiences. You can do this uh, by, by simply knowing, knowing our friends out there and be, being familiar with them and exploring and taking that. Um, to further hit the point home, Texas's wildlife diversity, we, um, in a study performed in, in the early 2000s, sort of ranking each of the states, the 
NatureServe folks did a State of the Union. And if in the State of the Union report published in 2002, we were the second, we reported the second highest number of species. We had the highest, second highest species diversity. California beat us out. We had the third highest number of endemic species. That means species that occur entirely within the boundary of that state, nowhere else in the world. We have the third highest number of endemic species of the 50 states of our union. Hawaii beat us, which is completely understandable because they're an island, everything evolved there, they, they create their own species. But California also beat us. California is always trying to take our thunder. Uh, first in bird and reptile species. Now there is some controversy here. Again, California has a higher accepted uh, bird species list. Um, but I think the argument is that there's, a, there's an incredible amount of vagrancy represented within that list and that those species that use the state as part of their natural full life cycle, that Texas would beat them. At least that's the argument that I read. I'm not here to make a point counterpoint. But certainly we lead in the number of, of reptile species for all states. And we're number two in mammals and plants. And that's a picture. I don't know, I don't really do a great job of this. So I'm gonna try to remember to pause. That's a photograph of a of an eastern patch nose snake. Uh, what about snakes? We have about 80 total species of snakes in Texas, give or take, 12 of which are venomous species. That includes four of the five uh, U.S. families. There's uh, only one family that, is, uh, that occurs in the United States that is not represented within Texas. I'll tell you about that in just a second. Of those that are here, we have the blind and thread snakes. These are the ones that look like little earthworms. Um, you may have seen before. We have advanced snakes, which are all of all basically the catch all group. This is all of the rat snakes, hog noses, just about everything that isn't a venomous snake or, or one of those blind snakes fits in this category. We have old world fixed fang snakes. So this is um, this is your coral snakes, which is a relative of cobras, among others. And then we have new world pit vipers, which are some of which are some of the most advanced evolutionarily advanced snakes in the world. Um, and those include our copperheads, cottonmouths and all of the rattlesnakes. The only family not represented uh, in Texas that occurs within the United States is the boa family. There is a rosy boa. <clears throat> there is a rosy boa that occurs. Um, I believe over uh, near California and in, in some of the Highland areas going out that way, uh, that is pretty range restricted. That's the only uh, boa within the United States. And then we have uh, one or two endemic species. And I say one or two because taxonomists like to argue about splitting or lumping. Um, right now they're split out, poncho, water snake, Brazos water snake, they're, um, they're, they're probably on divergent evolutionary paths with some exclusion for the two, for the populations to meet one another. Um, I think that's what the argument is. Uh, they're very close and the Concho water snake is, is primarily associated with the Colorado and Concho river basins, the Brazos water snake with the Brazos um, basin. So Texas has an incredible amount of diversity, lots of things to celebrate, if, even if you're just looking at birds, even if you're just looking at reptiles, but we have some crazy conservation challenges. And this map illustrates um, the change in open space land uses over the last 20, 30 years. And the darker the green shading is, the more intense or the higher the rate of conversion of lands from open space uses like ranching and farming to developed Walmart houses, infrastructure, roads and transmission lines. And a lot of that um, development is incur occurring in what is called the, the kind of the Texas triangle here between the Fort Worth, Dallas uh, Metroplex, San Antonio and Houston. 
We're projected to grow from about 30 million people in the state of Texas right now to 50 million in just a short couple of decades. And the majority of that growth is uh, projected to occur within that triangle. However, you'll note that you all are definitely not immune to this development. And you can see that all over the place anytime you travel there. I've been coming down to the valley for about 10 years. And even in that short period of time, um, the amount of development that I've noticed is, is immense. Um, and El Paso is getting some of the same, same flavor. Uh, another, another point that I'll make here is that Texas leads the nation in, in, in open space or working lands lost over the last 20 years. Uh, we have lost 2.2 million acres to development across the state of Texas in a 20 year period, 20 year period. You would have to have had your head um, in the sand if you did not notice uh, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, the 3 billion birds report, which illustrated to us that over the last 50, uh, over the last 50 years, that um, the United States ha has lost about 3 billion individuals from the total number of birds that once flew uh, and utilized the state. And that was approximately one in four. So about a quarter of all of those birds have been lost. And that's just total population. That's total population across all species. You can dig in a little bit and see that those, those declines hit some groups, some habitat specialists more than others. Uh, you can see, for instance, that shorebirds are down about 37%. Aerial insectivores are down about 32%. So, um, those that have been hit the hardest are, include those grassland obligate species like the eastern meadowlark here that have experienced about a 53% decline in the last 50 years. Grasslands in general are, are some of the most endangered habitat types across the continent. Uh, we can also see that eastern forest birds and migratory species uh, in general have, have declined um, pretty significantly. But we also have some pretty big wins in recovering species. And, and you know, in particular, we know many of us know the story of waterfowl, um, a story of recovery that has occurred largely um, due to the pocketbooks of our sportsmen and sportswomen, our hunters, who buy hunting licenses, who buy duck stamps, and who support organizations like Ducks Unlimited and recirculate those dedicated dollars. Once they spend those dollars on hunting licenses, duck stamps, they're locked into conservation. Those dollars can't be spent anywhere else. So uh, we see um, uh, you know, some models play out, models of success play out. So sportsmen, sportswomen have been huge in, um, in promoting the North American model of, of wildlife recovery, especially with wetlands and waterfowl. Raptors? The story there is, I think um, we can give the nod to Rachel Carson and her book, Silent Spring, who, who awoken the social conscience to the plight of DDT and birds and, and, and raptors and, and eagles in particular. Uh, our awareness, the social awareness and the push for the uh, Environmental Protection Agency and um, advancing some of our thoughts around chemical use and farming best practices have allowed for the recovery of hawks and eagles and brown pelicans. Woodpeckers, um, the story I believe there is that we have um, a situation where a lot of our forests that were just tore the heck up during the settlement age and early indus industry and development of our country have recovered. We are seeing way better forestry management practices, but we're also seeing the intersectionality of forest practices in our own neighborhoods. And as our neighborhoods are developed and some of them grow older, they're incorporating uh, urban forestry practices to promote tree growth in our yards and neighborhoods to both fight against some of the, the, the heat island uh, uh, phenomena that we experience in, in, in urban settings but also um, providing really nice habitat. And as you know, 
many of you know that woodpeckers are, are really big fans of trees of uh, and forests of mixed age where they can find younger trees, but also utilize older trees and dead trees that are snags for nesting cavities and uh, sites for food resources, bugs and grubs. That same report that I mentioned earlier, the nature serve report from 2002 at the time, it tried to categorize those species at risk within the state of Texas. And overall, we had about 10% of all species at some level of risk. Now that's not at risk of extinction and maybe it's not threatened, but it's at pretty dang close. Um, it might not have been as standardized. And on that list, we saw about 14% of reptiles. 20% of the amphibians and 23% of freshwater fish were at some risk of, um, of, of imperilment. Now today, fast forward, we have a, a little bit better planning tool to kind of help us highlight uh, species of concern. And uh, it's called the Texas Conservation Action, Action Plan. This is a plan that is funded by the federal government, but organized and put together by our state uh, DNR, Department of Natural Resources, which for us is the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. That plan outlines 1,300 different species of greatest conservation need. 1,300 species of greatest conservation need. And I'll define that SGCN in just a few minutes. But um, within that list, we have 18 species of, of, of snake listed, about 24% of our snakes, and 110 species of bird are listed. I went through and our state lists um, illustrates that we have about 650 plus species of birds that are favorably ranked on our, our state, state bird list, but about probably only 500 to 500 plus of those species use the state regularly as a part of their natural annual life cycle, meaning that you know, another 120, 150 of them are uh, probably one-time wonders or vagrant events. Um, so thinking about 500 species of birds that use the state uh, as part of their, their life cycle, migratory, overwintering, breeding, or resident, about 20% about 20% of our species are, uh, of birds are at some risk. Now, here's a, here's a visual definition of what a SGCN is. Again, species of greatest conservation need. Now, you're familiar with endangered. This is a species that is at risk of becoming endangered, threatened, threatened with becoming endangered. Um, and SGCN is a species who, through time, its population is starting to trend down. And the reason we want to we want to identify a species as an SGCN is because here is the time to intervene. Here is the time when we want to throw resources at it, when it doesn't cost as much, when we don't have to use regulatory burdens, when we don't have to incite uh, public opinion in the recovery, and we can start to we can still use a lot of voluntary tools and cost effectively. When a species gets down here and, and, and acquires a threatened or endangered species ranking and status, it is immensely costly financially, regulatory, public opinion wise. It's a controversial. Uh, it's always made a controversy and, and politicized. So the wisdom here is that if we can advocate for recovery of a species, when it becomes a species of greatest conservation need, when it's cost effective and making investments, that might be a wise use of our limited resources of time, manpower, and, and dollars. All right, we're gonna take a quick break and a breath. I'm gonna get a drink of water and we're gonna transition over to the Herping Texas 2021 Big Year, which is what a lot of folks are here for. All right, so, this is sort of a goofy project. Uh, a lot of people think it is, and that's certainly a goofy photograph of me. My wife likes it, but uh, it, I look like a goofball, I think. Um, a lot of people ask me why. Why would someone be interested in, um, in, in, in pursuing a big year, but on reptiles and amphibians? Well, I list a, a, a few points here. It's a passion project. It was born of COVID delir delirium. I wasn't able to do things like I normally once did. Uh, we're all going crazy and stir crazy living indoors primarily. I mean, I've always been an outdoorsy person. So this was a fun project to really kick off um, 
you know, what I was hoping to be kind of the putting the COVID year behind us, but as, as we all know, this thing continues to linger on. Um, it was also sort of the brainchild of a project that was picked up by Texas Parks and Wildlife as part of their Texas Nature Trackers initiatives. This is the, the program that kind of picks different species or groups of species and says, hey, we're going to start a project that focuses on monitoring, you know, reptiles or in this case, or a particular bird, you know, we have the the uh, Texas Nature Watcher or Parrot Watch down there in the valley that you're familiar with. So, so different things, but they had a Herps of Texas and they pre they presented a challenge to field herpers. Um, and, the, and the challenge was organized on the, on the iNaturalist platform. And it was called the Century Club Challenge. And for anybody that could go out in one year, 2000, during 2017, find, photograph, and document nine naturalists, the hundred species of reptile and amphibian in the state of Texas they gave great prizes to, headlamps, field guides, and um, all sorts of congratulatory things. So to me, the hundred, the, the triple digit was, it seemed like an insurmountable number. It's like, gosh, that's somebody's going to have to really like give, give a lot of their time up to go out and pursue that. But uh, my wife and I both said, well, let's, let's take a crack at it and see what we can do. And at, by the end of that year, you know, I had documented 106 species and became one of the five members of the of the, century, the Texas Herps of Texas Century Club. And, I, and it got me thinking, like, you know, wow, how many species are there out there? Where do you go to find them? And what is that number that a person that really knew what they were doing could get to? So. Um, I also saw this as an opportunity for continuing education. We're always we're always seeking to continue to learn. It keeps our our brains uh, growing and and, and kind of keeps us out of trouble. I mentioned earlier today uh, at the beginning of this talk that it was, I was developing a fledgling photography hobby, and I wanted to develop a bit develop it a bit more uh, through wildlife photography and specifically reptile and her and, and amphibian photography. And I also thought about it that this might be an opportunity to amplify um, conservation communi communication in general. You know, um, there's a lot of storytelling to be done through the lens of reptiles and amphibians, but also uh, herps just don't seem to have as many uh, warm and fuzzy stories outside of the Texas horn lizard, one, one of which I'm holding in this picture. So uh, maybe a way to put a spotlight on some of these malign species, some of these misunderstood species and poorly known species across the state. When I was developing rules, I didn't have an exact model to follow. There is no American herping society that puts out a list of rules and ethics to do, you know, to follow like the, the American Bird Ornithological Society and American Birding Clubs. So, um, so I aim to sort of uh, mirror in, in as many ways as possible the rules from the birding groups. Um, I put the, you know, in, in most cases, I have some sort of documentation for a species that is on a list. Um, I use the iNaturalist uh, database. And, um, and then I use the tag herp TX21 as my tag on iNaturalist. Any species that is a dirty herp is a species that doesn't have a photograph associated with it or a recording of it calling in the case of many frogs and toads. I do allow roadkill because that is a, a well accepted way of documenting and incorporating science um, and distribution science range extensions and county records. Um, into the uh, pool of knowledge on, on reptiles and amphibians in the state of Texas. It's not desired. And I note when a species that I have observed that year has only been observed as roadkill or otherwise. Uh, group herping is okay, just like group birding is okay. However, it's really important that you're there herping with the group when a species that you're adding to your list is found. Um, just like in birding, you can't count a, a bird that you weren't there with the group um, when it was found, uh, unless you go back and refind it. And I do allow naturalized exotics, so I'm not going to the zoo and and you know picking out um, animals that are behind glass. But you know, in the case of many of the house geckos. Uh, brown and knolls, those animals that aren't uh, historically native to our to our state that are here now and 
you know, quite frankly, are a part of the uh, ecosystems with which they are found. I consider those naturalized, although they're exotics and they are a okay for my list. How I prepared for my herping big year, um, some game planning in the beginning of the year. I had, you know, I had a lot of really good experience over, over the preceding years. I have a really strong interest in reptiles and amphibians, uh, so studying field guides, and I got a lot of coordination with other field herpers that I know. I lean heavily on on the community, uh, the field herping community, and in particular, I have a lot of friends from universities um, and the, uh, the the herp departments and researchers that, uh, quite frankly, without them, there's a lot of species that I might not have on my list because these guys know where you can go see them and they have friendly relationships with landowners who own land and, and have uh, steward habitat that support those species. Um, I began using social media a little bit more strategically and less for the, uh, my daily frustration doses. Um, I started following relevant social media accounts, particularly uh, uh, wildlife photographers, because I'm just trying to learn about their techniques, and then some of the some of the reptile and amphibian enthusiast pages uh, can be pretty informative about how to how to develop a search um, a, a search a, a search vision for these animals and their habitat. And then I uh, relaunched a blog that I used to run that I, that I called Adventures with the Modern Texas Naturalist. Uh, you can see my logo down there. The, the landing page is moderntexasnaturalist.com. Um, it's relaunched. It doesn't have a whole lot of blogging on it. I really need to pick it up, but that's that's one of the places where I hope to start really digging in and writing and developing some chapters that I'll eventually uh, seek to publish in a, in a full-blown book uh, on this effort uh, moving forward. But until that time comes, I really wanted to take a second to promote this book, Herping Texas, a, The Quest for Reptiles and Amphibians by Michael Smith and Clint King. It's, bit, it's written a bit more like an adventure blog um, focused on reptiles. So they, they, they're doing the this sort of same thing, but over their lives and they're recounting and retelling all of the stories of adventures traveling to in search of uh, species. So it's really an interesting read. More adventure bloggish. Um, I'm, I'm a more I'm a bit more of a wildlife biologist, um, land management and conservation person. So, you know, there's one way that I'll probably differentiate my stories from these fellows. And of course, whenever you have a big year, you got to start talking about goals. That's always the first question anybody asks. How many do you want to see? Yada yada. At the beginning of the year, I really didn't know. I to be completely transparent and honest, I don't know the exact number of species there are in the state of Texas. I still haven't, you know, qualified that. There's a bit of back and forth in the taxonomy. Like I said, you know, you could wake up one day and it could be 225 species. And then the next day, a couple of papers come out and it could be 220 or 240, you know, whomever got the most recent set of papers in a journal. So um, I, I targeted, you know, based on that, 2017 Texas Parks and Wildlife Driven Century Club effort. I saw, you know, that I could get just over 100 with uh, within my normal travels of the state with with some special effort. The person that did the best that year got 140 species, and you know, he worked. Uh, he was a graduate student at Texas A&M and worked within the museum of uh, the Natural History Museum. So they was involved with a lot of research projects, a lot of travel across the state. Um, and, you know, a lot of his work was out collecting data and genetics and stuff on these species. So he had a really great high water mark set. So 140 was his high water mark and I naturalist before this effort. I set mine, my goal to 120, 125 species with an aspirational goal of 150. I also wanted to see at least 10 new species, put 10 new species on my life list, which at the time uh, sat at 100, or roughly 150-ish animals. And then another goal was to make sure that I share the adventures and conservation stories on my blog at moderntexasnaturalist.com. Now, I'm derelict at that. There's a couple of stories on there. They're pretty good. One of them is a bird story and a couple of uh, eastern Texas salamander stories, but I'm about to really push some content through that medium. 
what I have been pretty good at was this last goal, grow a social media audience following the Hurt Texas 21 hashtag and to be consistent and be engaging. And um, I'm not, you know, typically in a standard week, I'm trying to push out at least three photographs on my Instagram page and I'll do the same thing on my um, face, Facebook page. But with those photographs, I mean, these are my prizes from you know, developing the photography habit and skill set um, and so seeing some of these really cool species, but also include really short vignettes, a couple of sentences or a paragraph about about what you're seeing and where it was and what was happening, what I felt like and anything else interesting. And I, I'll have to say that this is my wife right here. And of course, without her, I, I wouldn't be doing any of this. She's very supportive. Of a, of a numb skull husband doing silly things all over the state and burning up gas money and sleeping in the bed of a truck and you know roadside stops. Um, she's been incredibly supportive and, and I'm thankful for it. But she's she's been right there with me, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Effort. Now I did not update this map today, but you can see here in in the map that um, that is. About I made this about 2 months ago, and it, it shows where I've been and where I've logged observations and I naturalist strictly reptile and amphibian observations in the state. And you can see, I've been almost everywhere. Um, I have been in every ecological region, although I may not have uh, posted an observation in e every ecological region yet, but I have been in every eco eco region of the state. Um, and. You know, I have to point out that the first half of the year, because of work obligations, and I was filling in for for some of our uh, short staffing at Audubon um, in the field, doing a lot of bird surveys. So I couldn't go where I wanted to, but but I was also being placed in really cool places like Sable Palm Sanctuary that, down there in South Texas, like some of the Nature Conservancy properties in the western part of the Edwards Plateau. So. Certainly was able to get out and, and see things, uh, but I had to do it um, opportunistically. I had opportunities uh, for limited travel and excursions, usually on on work nights and over over weekends. And I tried to stick pretty close to my home uh, here in Austin to do so. The state park that I went to the most is Palmetto State Park, kind of right here, just east of San Antonio. That's the the park where I did my master's thesis. Only 45 minutes from my house. I know it like the back of my hand, and there's an incredible amount of diversity in that small 200 acre uh, park. I, I volunteered to help uh, in as many research, uh, reptile and amphibian research projects as possible so that I could observe some very secretive species and to get um, behind locked, otherwise locked gates. And um, lots of dedicated weekend and vacations herping here in the second half of the year. Um, the second half of the year has been pretty great, um, except for uh, here into the fall when it's cooled down. Uh, very productive, uh, utilizing my, I've got like four weeks of vacation backlog. So, you know, I've got to start using more and more of it. Um, and, I, and I finally have and, and started to see and make some progress. The results so far. I've got 165 species favorably reported on the list. Only three of those species are dirty. So 200, 162 species that either have a really good photograph or really good recording of their, of their calling. Only three species are dirty. Those three species include the cliff chirping frog, which is super common here in central Texas. Um, and it, it sounds just like y'all's Rio Grande chirping frog. I'm also missing a Woodhouse's toad that I dumbly didn't record when I heard it. And then a green sea turtle that I couldn't get my camera focused on when its head popped up out of the water in Galveston Bay. So those three species, trust me, I saw them. I had, and I actually had um, some witnesses with me. But um, if you don't count those, if you don't want to count those, I'm at 162 species. 13 species of salamander, and I'll and I'll point out that um, I've been sandbagging on salamander. Central Texas has an amazing amount of diversity within the spring salamander complex. So there's probably six species of salamander that I could go out and look for in one weekend here whenever the time's right. Most of the 13 salamanders that are on here are, are actually more secretive and hard to find. 
35 frog species of frogs and toads. And the number in the parentheses beside it is the number of these are species that were brand new to my life list. So that's a 13 species of salamander with seven of those being lifers for me. 35 species of frogs and toads, uh, six of which are new to my life list. One alligator, there's only one species of alligator in Texas. Uh, 23 species of turtles, five of which are new. 40 species of lizard, five new. 53 species of snake, six new. For a to and, and that total new lifers is 29. Now you remember that my aspirational goal was 150 species. We've exceeded that uh, significantly. And um, we've exceeded that significantly, and, and I'm kind of resetting the, the crossbars probably closer to 175 at this point. I think I could probably rattle 10 more species out before the year closes. And as cool to me, I've had a 29 life species. Now, I reported earlier that, um, that my wife has been doing some herping with me. She's, she's gone with me on several trips this year, not all of them. Her list, crazy enough, is about 130 to 135 species right now. So she's blowing it out of the water also and having a lot of fun. Uh, lizard in the picture is a five-lined uh, skink from East Texas. I uh, I took the liberty of, of, of breaking out snakes because a lot of, a lot of presentations I get people really get jived in on snakes. I've got 53 spe the 53 species listed here. Um, it's kind of funny. You would think that I'd seen a, a, quite a few more, but I've only seen 180 live snakes that I could confidently ID uh, in the field this year. And then, uh, in, you know, beside the list, and it kind of goes in order of when I saw them, is, is the number of individuals I saw of that species. If it's blank, like black neck garter snake, that's because I found it, but I found it as a dead on road specimen, not alive. Same thing here with the plains hog nose and glossy snake and speckled king snake. Um, the most abundant snake that I've seen out there, 27 individuals of the western diamondback rattlesnake. Uh, I've seen 11 Mississippi green water snakes, and that was basically in one night when I went out to McFadden uh, National Wildlife Refuge in southeast Texas by Beaumont. So there's a, this isn't like, I don't think this is a good illustration of, um, of like general relative abundance of, of one species to the next, because in most circumstances, the most abundant species you'll ever see are all the water snakes. But once I got the water snakes, I didn't need to look near water anymore. So I'm off to, you know, dry land upland species and uh, avoiding those other sites because I'm looking for a specific subset uh, of individuals. And so inherently there's biases associated with any sort of big day, big year effort. Um, and then we'll transition into the last um, element of the talk. Uh, this is one I like to go through, and, and you know, I hope you guys are thinking through some questions if you'd like to ask any at the end of this. Uh, but this is just a slideshow of some of the of the species I've observed throughout the year. I'll call them selects. I selected these because I think they are great photographs, really cool individuals, and a few interesting stories that I can share. And the first one I'll share, and these are kind of listed in chronological order from when I seen when I observed them throughout uh, throughout the year. Um, our first trip was right after New Year's into East Texas, taking advantage of some rains that they got. There's a whole small group of salamanders that um, that at, at those first are, are scattered throughout the winter, the, the warmer rains that collect and start to fill some of those ephemeral depressions that become small ponds that have no predatory fish in them. These salamanders will fill will feel the ground tinkling and 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 they'll emerge from the ground and they'll migrate to those vernal pools to to do all of their breeding for the year uh the marbled salamanders is one of those species and this is one of the most beautiful species that that i think we have in the state of texas um but it's just a, a really a really great example another one of the salamanders out in east texas one of the larger species is a spotted salamander And then there's another species out there. Now, this one doesn't live underground year round. Um, it's a little bit more um, surface active longer, but it's got a super limited 
uh, niche habitat. And so out in East Texas, where you're going to find these are associated with sloped woodlands with clear spring runs. And um, the reason they're so limited is because there's so much um, groundwater development out there. There's so much development surface development that has, uh, you know, wasted away spring sites and, and wetlands that this species utilizes. So there's only a few known populations of this animal in East Texas, and it's uh, highly, I won't say endangered or necessarily a threatened, but, um, but it should be perhaps uh, considered threatened. It's extremely limited and its habitat is uh, continually under threat particularly with the groundwater use. Just a simple cool season at Green and Knoll from Palmetto State Park in January. What's interesting about reptiles and amphibians is that they, they um, many of them will become dormant or less active during the cold season, but some of them are only active during the cold season and some of them are active almost year round on any day that warms up. Texas is a, is a unique state where you know, a, 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 a midwinter day can get up into the upper 70s, be bright and sunny. And um, that's more than enough uh, for, for some of these animals. Cool picture of a, of a green and all. This is from my first trip down y'all's way. Uh, I think this was at um, Benson. And this was the first time I'd ever seen giant toad, hence the uh, asterisk up there. This is a giant toad, or some folks may call it cane toad. Um, a lot of folks, particularly throughout the remainder of the state, think that this is an invasive species, an exotic species, but it is perfectly native um, and not, it's not naturalized. It's native to South Texas. It's a part of the natural ecosystem. Uh, they're huge, bigger than my hand when they're full adults. Uh, big gnar gnarly cranial crests, uh, really easy to identify. This individual had something going on with, I don't know what's going on with these toes, but those are little bones protruding out of its skin with these really sore looking red areas around the, the first knuckle. I, I, I'm just uncertain what was going on with this individual, but I felt poor for him. This is one of my favorite photographs from the year, an observation of a ring-necked snake. Uh, this is a small, really, really small snake associated with grasslands in particular. Uh, but one of their defensive mechanisms is to coil up and, and roll up their tail and show you the underside of that tail. Whereas the belly is bright yellow or sort of orangish, that tail is bright, bright red. Letting you know. They're not venomous. Uh, well, they're not venomous the people uh, they are they can put a smack on some insects that's a that's a that's an interesting little side note that um, there are many more snakes than what we're familiar with that are that are technically venomous but they are not medically significant to humans um, but they have a uh, you know in some cases a very niche protein package that only hits for instance centipedes or whatever their prey preferred prey items are, and it impacts those animals like no other, but really nothing to us. This is the Rio Grande Cooter. This is um, this is at Dolan Falls Preserve on the Devil's River. This is uh, Dolan Falls, which is probably one of the most photographed waterfalls in the state of Texas. This is a this is a, a turtle that is. Um, that is only found and associated with the Rio Grande and its tributary basins, including the Pecos River. One of our central Texas denizens, the Western slimy salamander with its beautiful, big bulgy eyes, they're lungless salamanders. They do most of their uh, breathing through um, uh, transpiration through their skin. Pretty interesting uh, life history there. They'll they'll lay their eggs uh, and and have them fully developed within sort of moist cavities of the ground and, and the limestone caves here in Central Texas. Bairds, rat snakes. We have several species of rat snakes. This is our hill country special to, specialist. You can also find these at the higher elevations of the mountains of far west Texas. A beautiful snake. This one was found around Camp Wood, Texas in Real County. 
everybody's favorite, the Western Diamondback Rattlesnake. I almost stepped on this animal as I was performing a bird survey here in, in Austin. It was so chill and so relaxed that I trusted it way more than I should have and took this uh, photograph that is not a telephoto zoom lens that I'm using. This is a macro lens. Um, kind of broke a couple of my own rules that day, but I got this photograph and I'm, and I'm no worse for the wear, but I, I typically don't take those sorts of risks. I mean, I was fairly safe. I don't want to overstate that I was in, in a lot of danger. I wasn't poking this thing in the face, but I got, I got just within the bubble or just at the edge of striking distance bubble. So Texas coral snake, I found it in my neighborhood. You know, this is an urban species. You see these a lot down there in, in, in y'all's country. Um, up here, I'm always, I'm always letting folks know that get overly concerned about seeing one of these that, that quite literally, that's probably the last time you'll ever see that individual again. This is not in our country, the, a snake species that spends a lot of time above ground. They're not observed often. Uh, they, they typically are, are shy and reclining and uh, are retiring and um, don't have a, a whole a whole lot of interest in being around people. Um, I show this. This was taken at Sable Palm Sanctuary. This is just a common spotted whiptail. And I say just a common spotted whiptail because there's about eight, nine different species of, of whiptail and race runner in the state of Texas that look just like this lizard. And about seven of those species are parthenogenic. And that word is a fancy way of saying all female. And the, there, there are no males in those other species, um, not common spotted whiptail, but others like the Laredo striped whiptail, Chihuahuan spotted whiptail in West Texas. They're all female tribes, and every individual is a clone of its mother. Very interesting life history, and, and something that you just didn't even know exist until you scratch or, or until you dig. You can't scratch on the natural history of these species and discover these things. You got to kind of dig. Really interesting. Uh, also taken at Sable Palm Sanctuary, the Emery's rat snake. Or down there, some people will call them the thorn scrub rat snake. Mexican tree frog, that, whose uh, entire distribution in the state of Texas is limited to a few counties in the Rio Grande Valley. It looks a lot like the gray tree frog that I know of here in central Texas, but they're actually in different uh, genus. This is my prized, one of my prized finds this year was the Mexican burrowing toad. You guys are probably familiar with this. It's down there in the, around the Rio Grande City area, limited to about two counties in Texas, and that's its entire distribution in the United States. So we got a species that is incredibly range restricted. Lots of them down in Mexico, but we always kind of pretend like, you know, Mexico doesn't matter. It, it does a lot matter. But in Texas, it's limited to these two counties. So we see an example of it only teetering into the state. But it's made further complicated by the fact that this is a species that spends its entire life underground, except for af right after huge rainfall events exceeding three inches typically. And you all just don't get enough of those to bring these guys above ground very often. So you have to have the intersectionality of being in the right place at the right time, having the right weather conditions. And then you're still hassled by the fact that everywhere that these animals occur are private property. So you can hear them calling, but you can't go across that fence without trespassing. So it's really difficult to get to see, observe, and photograph this animal in the state of Texas. Uh, the night that I found it, I heard them as soon as it got dark. It was the night after a big rain in May. It took me about five hours before I could find one calling in a ditch beside the road driving around. So, um, this is one of one of my favorite things. Now, the cool thing is this thing would fill would fill the palm of my hand, and it would feel like jelly or jello if I jiggled it. It is a crazy looking critter. You all all know the speckled racer. We've got a pretty healthy population of them down there at Sable Palm Sanctuary, just uh, outside of Brownsville. This is uh, man one of the one of the most beautiful species of snakes in in, th in the state of Texas. A black background with that emerald green dotting in each scale. 
Um, just truly spectacular. A couple of uh, photographs of snakes that uh, um, started practicing uh, trying to catch habitat scenes behind the ant, the, the focal animal. And this is these next two photographs um, were taken at a ranch I helped manage up here in the hill country near Fredericksburg, the plain bellied water snake, and then this western ribbon snake. There's a picture of your endemic concho water snake, a species that was once federally in, uh, listed as threatened or perhaps endangered is no longer listed, but is being considered put being put back on that list. <laughs> this is at a big lake and reservoir. My first Texas horned lizard of the year. This is also the cover. Uh, image on the magazine uh, that we mentioned earlier from the Texas Land Conservancy, Texas Forever. Red spotted toad at sunset at Independence Creek Preserve right off of the Pecos River in the western part of the Edwards Plateau. And then it's at the same site, a round-tailed horned lizard basking in the last uh, last rays of sun at the end of a long day. That night, found a mottled rock rattlesnake hanging up in ambush, waiting for a lizard or a unsuspecting rodent to, to pass by. And the other prize of my year, and this is one of the holy grails of East Texas, uh, the Western Pygmy Rattlesnake. People uh, will spend their entire field herping lives searching for this animal in Texas and not find it. It is the smallest of our Texas rattlesnakes, the smallest of our eight species of rattlesnake in Texas. You, uh, in this individual, when I found it, um, first off, I, I, I let out like a, a banshee cry and scream, you know, mixed scream and cry in the deep in the forest of Far East Texas. It probably confused a lot of people if anybody heard me. So happy about it. Um, but when I put it, when I picked it up, and I did pick it up, and I put it in a bucket, not with my hands, of course, with some tools. Um, unlike a, most other rattlesnakes, this thing will rattle, but you cannot hear it. Um, you just cannot hear, unless you're kind of close, uh, what the sound of this rattle sounds like because it is so tiny. It's barely, um, barely, barely a rattle. I mean, you can see something there, but it doesn't look like our typical rattle. Here's a Mexican spadefoot toad. This is another species of frog that lives most of its life underground, um, but they can be pretty commonly found out in the grasslands of far west Texas after, you know, during the monsoonal season when there's pretty regular rainfall events. Texas banded gecko, one of the most beautiful lizards we have. You cannot, I don't think, appreciate that species enough, and that eye is amazing. Eastern black-tailed rattlesnake. This one's kind of in a blonde phase. It can get a lot darker, um, a lot more contrast of black, white, and gray. This one's more of a tan, brown, and blonde. So almost a bluish eye. Really calm disposition in most of these individuals. So really nice for rattlesnakes. This is a really nice one. Big body guy too. Western uh, tiger salamander. Um, this is a, a species that uh, you may associate with the high plains of the panhandle. Uh, if you get a good monsoonal year, these guys can emerge from the ground where they where they stay throughout most of the year and just be thick as thick as thieves in some of the bar ditches and roadside pools. And then I also found while up there this yellow-bellied mud turtle, whose whose story is really interesting. A, a species of turtle associated with ponds and slow-moving bodies of water. They're in the musk turtle family, which means that they can um, produce a extremely foul-smelling, clear-looking substance from glands near the rear, or near their rear end. Uh, but um, so you know, it's not a not a not super wise to pick them up unless you got somewhere to go wash your hands immediately afterwards. But also interesting is that this is a species that is associated with super dry deserty climates like the Texas Panhandle and far west Texas. And many of those ponds completely dry out during um, during droughty periods. This animal, and I don't know exactly how it does it, 
during, when those ponds dry out, it'll dig itself down into the mud and sort of estivate until the next cycle of good rains. And, and that can be years, years that they are living underground. So I don't know how they breathe. I don't know how they, I don't know a lot about them, but it is an interesting species, interesting life history. Here is a glass lizard, and many of you are probably looking at that photograph and saying, Romy, that animal does not have legs. You're right, and it is still a lizard. Uh, a couple of ways to know that it's a lizard is that if I touched its eye, it would blink. It has eyelids. Snakes do not have eyelids. Um, and I always go back to like Harry Potter, the first Harry Potter movie when the when the snake uh, winks at Harry for for magically making the glass disappear and letting the snake the, the, uh, escape uh, and it winks and, and people often tell me like, yeah, I understand that boa constrictors don't have uh, eyelids, but you do realize that you're watching a, a, a science fiction uh, movie, right, Romy, about magical wizards and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I, I get it. Um, the other thing about uh, that makes this a the glass lizard a lizard is that it has a an, an ear hole. It's kind of not easy to see, but right around here there's an ear hole um, that you can see. And I saw this. Um, you guys have this probably down there. Um, maybe maybe there's some individuals as far down as like Boca Chica Beach in that area. But I found this one on Padre Island, uh, and I'm not certain how far down they get. The plateau spot, spot tilt earless lizard is really cute, small lizard associated with the Edwards Plateau. Now, y'all have one down there, the Tomalipan spot tailed earless lizard that is probably, uh, that looks just like this one, a, a bit bigger bodied, um, that is probably going to go on the endangered species list or be considered a candidate species for endangered status. They have, uh, their range has, um, seemingly uh, been reduced ex extensively. Um, there's so much private lands in South Texas that it's hard to make strong inferences from the limited amount of access and data we've been able to collect. But where you do find them is over uh, kind of west of Corpus Christi in the cotton fields, and they love cotton fields for some reason. At least that population does. Everybody's favorite, the Texas tortoise. I think a strong candidate for um, you know, maybe reptile, this should maybe consider a, another state reptile. I love this animal. It's got a beautiful uh, pattern, great disposition, just, just a wise looking creature. Western rat snake or Texas rat snake. You ever have a, if anybody ever calls you and says, Hey, I got a, I got a snake in my house. I mean, like 99, I mean, nine times out of 10, it's going to be a Western rat snake. These animals are incredible climbers. They can find their way up almost vertical walls. Um, just really interesting species here. Uh, here I took another picture of a round tailed horn lizard, but I got fancy with it, trying to challenge myself to take some cooler, cooler, more interesting photographs incorporated a scene during sunset in far west Texas while at Elephant Mountain Wildlife Management Area. Here's another similar photograph taking advantage of, of another sunset with a desert box turtle. And there's a different individual box turtle munching down. I found this one on the road, uh, munching down on a road killed Texas toad. And uh, what's interesting here, a couple of notes that um, the, the ornate or desert box turtle and the eastern three toed box turtle, um, a lot of times, um, and this is, this is pretty consistent, not perfect, but if they have blood red eyes like this individual, then that's a male. And most of the females will have, uh, you can't really make it out, but yellow eyes like this, like this one here. But that's a, um, that's a male eating roadkill. The rough-footed mud turtle is very similar to the um, the mud turtle we discussed earlier, except this rough-footed mud turtle um, will will likely be the, the the version and flavor that occurs in Texas will probably be elevated to it's from subspecies to a full species status, um, and it will be called the Big Bend mud turtle or Chihuahuan Desert mud turtle, and it is probably our most range restricted species of reptile in the state in that it can only be found in one creek system um, south of Marfa, Texas, uh, and it, as a tributary to the Rio Grande. And it's only occurring within that desert wash. 
uh, one of my, and, and we're about wrapped up. I know I'm probably lingering on here, but this is the Big Ben patch nose, a, a really, really beautiful species of snake that occurs uh, around Big Bend National Park, uh, Black Gap Wildlife Management Area, and some of the western uh, slopes and plains uh, just west of the Davis Mountains. Big Bend slider, uh, a species of turtle that is only associated with the Rio Grande. And then last, um, last slide for us tonight is the mountain short horned lizard. Uh, we have three species of horned lizard. I've told you about the round tailed horned lizard and the Texas horned lizard, but the mountain short horned lizard is, is this is exclusively within the high elevations of, of three mountain chains of West Texas, the Davis mountains, the Guadalupe mountains and the Franklin mountains near El Paso at about 6,6500 feet and above. I got a lot of people to thank for, for supporting my big year this year. I won't go through all of these names, but you can tell it takes a village um, to make the progress. Got to have a lot of friends to do a lot of this fun work. And with that, I close and thank you guys. I mean, really appreciate your audience, your attention. I know that um, I'm a rambler. I talk for a long time. Um, and, and this was the the short version, the hustled version. Um, I love speaking about these animals. Again, I think that they're, they're misunderstood, a bit maligned, mischaracterized, overly persecuted, but they have some like, you know, there's an incredible amount of diversity represented within this group. And, and you can really dig into a particular species to tell the story of landscape scale conservation, need challenges, opportunities, um, you can look at some of these species that, that represent, you know, for instance, the Mexican tree frog that you guys have down there. You're only finding that in a very specific region of the state and, and it represents a completely different region of the continent um, than anyone else across the United States may be familiar with. So some really interesting storytelling. If you want to learn more, feel free to reach out. There's my Instagram handle. Um, actually, it's romyswanton.wildlife now, but you're going to find me if you look up at my old name there. The, the website's Modern Texas Naturalist. Get familiar with the logo, email address. It's fine to use my work email address if you ever want to reach out. And uh, I encourage you to because I really want to hear some feedback as I'm grappling with the idea of turning this uh, big year effort into the plot for a book but not a plot to tell the story of the finding animals, the plot of telling the story of the animals, their relationship to the, the landscapes and celebrating Texas and its wonderful wildlife diversity. With that, I'll stop sharing the screen. Bounce out and if there's any questions, if we have time, I'm, I'm happy to stick around and, and uh, hang out with folks. Well, Rami, unfortunately we do get kicked out of the library at eight o'clock. So, okay, but thank you so much. I, there's a lot of comments uh, out there about your photographs. People really enjoyed it. And for those that had had questions, I may compile a list and send them out to you and share with the chapter once you get a chance to take a look at those questions. Sure. Yeah. And I apologize for going for a long time here. If folks do compile quite a few photographs or have feedback. I welcome it. And I would not be opposed to setting up a Zoom for a select few folks that want to dig in for 30 minutes or something to answer questions afterwards because I'm so long winded and overly and, extended. And definitely let us know when you're back down in the valley doing some of your, your searches because I think we'd be definitely love to join you and help you in any way we can. Well, uh, thank you for that reminder and I will, um, I'll be aiming to get down to the valley and I'll give you and Barbara a heads up when I do that. Uh, we'll be doing some work at Sable Palm Sanctuary and would probably welcome the opportunity to get some, some help in the field, whether it's looking at birds or doing some my naturalist documentation of vegetation or reptiles down there. Or if anybody wants to teach me how to use a camera, I'll take that too. All right. Well, thanks again, Rami, and I really do appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Uh, and to, for everyone else, we'll end our meeting tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us online. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you.